From the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, HEC-TV, Boeing, and the Danforth Center are proud to present Conversations, a discussion with Dr. James C. Carrington. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Boy, you guys quiet down really fast. Thank you very much. My name is Robin Frankel. I am chair of the Friends Committee, and I want to welcome all of you this evening. The Friends Committee hosts the Conversations series, and um, I know I'm going to go out of order, but if you are not a member of the Friends Committee and would like to be part of our group, I hope that you will consider joining the Friends Committee. We have lots of programs throughout the year. Um, this conversation series is only one of them, and we would love to have you involved with us all the time. Um, this evening we've got a great program, and before I introduce the, uh, the speakers, I want to tell you that Boeing Company has sponsored the conversation series for four consecutive years, and we want to thank them for their support. <laughs> thank you. And in case you um, had too many glasses of wine or you want to tell some of your friends about this evening, um, this evening's program will be broadcast on HEC TV. Um, and that is going to be aired on, beginning on Sunday, September the 18th at 5 p.m. And I know you won't remember this, but you can always look in your cable guide for HEC TV. But if you are a charter cable customer, that will be on channel 989 digital. And you, if you are an AT&T universe customer, it is on channel 99. So remember that. All right. Um, as you came in this evening, you may have taken a card. And that is how we would like you to ask your questions. Um, someone will be around in the aisles and they will be collecting your questions. If we um, go through most of those questions and there is time, we will ask you for questions from the floor. Um, so there may be an opportunity, but really the best way to have your question answered is to write it down on one of those cards. Um, and I talked about the We've got a slide about, yes, World Food Day. So World Food Day is a very exciting um, event at the Danforth Plant Science Center. This year, it takes place on the weekend of October the 14th and 15th. And our goal is to package, um, I think, 500,000 packages of food to send to Tanzania to help people who are starving um, have have food to eat it, for a week. A package that you put together on World Food Day feeds a family of four for a week. We are looking for 3,000 volunteers to help package food. And this doesn't mean you have to be here all day. You can come for an hour or two hours. And it's really an exciting experience and you're with a lot of people and there's a lot of enthusiasm. So if you've got some time on the 14th and 15th and would like to participate in this event, we hope that you will, um, you will volunteer. We also encourage people to understand that, you know, in addition to the food that you're packaging, it fulfills our mission of feeding the hungry, not through those packages, obviously, but you'll learn more about what the Danforth Plant Science Center is doing in terms of helping people um, in underdeveloped countries and throughout the world get the techniques and the me mechanisms that they need to be sustainable farming and, um, and solve <coughs> the problem of world hunger. So um, now I would like to introduce Jim Davis, who is going to be our moderator this evening and Jim Carrington, who will be the host. But I also want to give a special welcome, I don't know where she's sitting, to Terry Carrington. I don't know how many of you have met her, but if she would stand up. I know she's here, because I took her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Way in the back. Okay, 
And so now I want to turn the program over to Jim Davis and Jim Carrington. Thank you very much. Well, I want to join in welcoming everyone here this evening. We have a, a very good crowd. Um, everyone is curious about uh, the new president. Uh, You heard that questions will be coming in uh, written form. Uh, my job, for those of you who are new in this series, is to start things off with 15 or 20 minutes of questions to sort of warm up the audience. <coughs> and then I s step aside and simply select and read the questions you all have sent in. So you can see, if you don't send in questions, this is a very short program. <laughs> well, I want to start off. Uh, Jim, by asking, what brought you here? Uh, you, you obviously have been in plant science a long time. What characteristics or features um, of the Plant Science Center said to you, this is the place I want to be? Well, before I answer that, I want to thank you for having me and thank Robin and the Friends Committee. This is a real honor. Um, now, I should tell you ahead of time that Jim and I talked uh, we this is the second time. We, 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 we talked a couple of weeks ago, and I said, can you make this not boring? And I, I said, that's his problem. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm going to try to do is come up with as many stories to answer the questions as possible. Um, now, I haven't planned these ahead of time, although uh, as we were sitting here, I thought of a good story I could lead off with. Um, to lead into that answer, why did I come here? But let me, let me go back 30 years, and apologies to those of you who were at another event last week where I told this story, and it's about coming here. Uh, 30 years ago, I was relating to a group at Monsanto, my first professional exposure to the Monsanto company, and this is when they were, in 1981, they were developing their biotech group, and they sent recruiters out to University of California, Riverside, looking for new hires, technicians, scientists, and I was in a small group where they put a pitch on, and I thought it was very interesting, but after the pitch, I turned to one of my friends and said, why would anybody want to move to St. Louis? <laughs> now go forward 30 years, and this opportunity came about, and we planned to move to St. Louis. And we wanted to set up, and we maybe can talk about this later, a computing group, a bioinformatics group. Now, uh, Noah Falgren doesn't know that this story is coming, uh, but Noah was a graduate student in the lab at the time, and he's a very talented computer scientist who uh, is integrated in lots of different projects. And I wanted Noah to head up this computing group, this bioinformatics group. Uh, but Noah had an offer, a postdoctoral offer, from University of California, Riverside, my alma mater. And I went into Noah's office and said, Noah, why do you want to go to Riverside? <laughs> come, come to St. Louis. That doesn't answer your question at all, but I thought it would be a, a good story. It's as in the teaching business, it's what I'd call a response, but not an answer. Noah came, and he's here, and uh, he's doing a lot of work setting up the bioinformatics group. Why did I come here? This is the place in the world that has the greatest potential to make a big impact in agriculture as it relates to food production and as it relates to bioenergy. There's no other independent institute or center or aggregate of any type uh, in the public arena that is, that is that, that interfaces with the public and takes public funds to do the work that we want to do here. This is the best place that has the most potential to make the biggest impact over a long period of time. That was the primary appeal. Coming and talking with people associated with the Danforth Center, 
uh, first and foremost, Dr. Danforth just illuminated uh, in painful detail the vision that was set up 13 years ago. Not painful detail, wonderful detail. And this in aggregate, the mission, the commitment of the founders, uh, the commitment of lots of peripheral organizations, and very importantly, as I told our friends group, the leadership of the friends group today, the community and the supporters and the volunteers and everybody who chooses to associate themselves with the Danforth Center makes this a unique place and I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to come. This is my main recruiting tool. <laughs> I see some of the, the new scientists that we've recruited here and this is exactly what I told them. And we've had a lot of people come <laughs> after, uh, after we, we started up a recruiting effort. Um, it's a compelling reason to come to St. Louis but specifically the Danforth Center. Well, I want to talk ab in a bit about recruiting specifically, but I understand that y you don't feel like you've learned a lot if you're, sim if you're simply told this is a good place. Um, so I won't tell you it's a good place. Uh, what I want to ask is, um, now that you're here and have been had your feet on the ground a little bit, what do you want to add? What do you want to focus on? What do you want to strengthen or modify? I can tell you what we're doing and give you lots of examples. Uh, first of all, be careful to always keep your eye on the mission. The mission is to produce more, higher quality, better food, preserve the environment, and promote the region around the plant science economy. So uh, everything that we want to do needs to focus on those three sub-points of the mission. Now, there's a lot of space in each of those points. We have a wonderful group here that works, actually a couple of groups, that work on plants as sources of medicine. This is fundamental to our, message, uh, our, our mission as well, uh, feeding people, using plants to make lives better. Uh, so everything that we do and how we do it has to serve the mission. What we're building up here uh, specifically with some new hires. And when I say new hires, I'm talking about new investigators who lead groups that re recruit other scientists to their group and form a, a nucleus and a, um, a, a cluster of 10, 12, 15 people uh, that focus on a set of problems. The types of people that we're interested in are those who are using uh, technology that we don't currently have in the center or that was underrepresented before and that we're bringing in. So computational biology, I mentioned NOAA, but we have other new investigators like Todd Mockler here in the front row. They're bringing in new technology, high throughput technology and computation because advances in biology these days, plant science is no exception, is absolutely dependent on people who can run computers. And mm -hmm. I don't just mean plug them in and run uh, canned programs. People who can use computers, write programs, organize data, harvest other people's data, and then process the data, analyze it, and get answers out that are meaningful to important problems. I'll give you an example with Todd, again, who's in the front row here. I saw Todd's picture uh, in one of the rotating slides. Todd uses computers to figure out how plants respond to stressful environments. When we have a drought, for example, or when we have a flood, the opposite of a drought, plants are under stress, just like people. Plants get under stress. In fact, plants can't run away and take medicine or run inside and get out of the cold. Plants have to stand there and take it. And this is the amazing thing about plants and the processes whereby they adapt to their environments, evolve to withstand stress, to recognize pathogens and mount defense responses. Uh, many of these things are unique to plants. R people don't do it, animals don't do it. And we need to understand how all of these things work and we need new technology to do this. The other major area that we're recruiting in is in bioenergy. We all understand the problems with dependence on fossil fuel 
It's a limiting resource. Eventually, we'll run out of usable fossil fuel. And there's a huge environmental cost to using fossil fuels. A whole lot of carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere. We also have agricultural systems that degrade the environment. So bioenergy and new types of agriculture that preserve soil, use less water, use less fertilizer. Fertilizer is not only a limiting resource, it's also really expensive and environmentally, energy-wise, very costly. So these are the areas that we're recruiting in. Uh, the technologies that we're developing are centered around computers, robotics. If you come back in six or 10 months, you'll see lots of different facilities and you'll see science done in a very different way than we did just a few years ago. What are the obstacles to progress? What will hold us back, if anything? There are lots of obstacles. Number one, we don't have enough people working on the important problems. This is why it's so important for the Danforth Center to recruit the very best scientists in the world to get on board. Uh, we're limited on funds. Uh, most of the funds traditionally have come from the federal government, from granting the agencies. The federal government's trying to cut the budget. This is a problem for us, for the Danforth Center and for the scientists, uh, for our research, because the funding comes from that portion of the budget that is frequently referred to as discretionary. Uh, the National Science Foundation is uh, not only at risk as part of the discretionary budget, uh, but there are actually some antagonists out there for the type of science that is funded by the National Science Foundation, the National, uh, uh, the, the USDA, uh, the National Institutes of Health. You might not think would be a big funder of plant science, but it actually is. We get quite a bit of granting funding from the NIH. That's at risk, and it's at risk for all of the reasons that we understand or that we know about. We also get a lot of funding from private organizations like the Gates Foundation, uh, the Howard Buffett Foundation. Now, those foundations on a historical, if you look at the historical trends, are increasing their giving. And I think there's every reason to think that the contribution of private funds to the type of science that we do here is going to increase. It has to increase. As rapidly as the federal budget may shrink? That, that may not. That, that I, I wouldn't say that, and I couldn't tell you that those curves are going to balance each other. Uh, but it has to happen. And there's a lot of awareness among uh, the foundations for exactly this problem. You're aware that Bill Gates is aggregating people who are uh, highly wealthy to give away half their money. A lot of that money is going to go to scientific research. Howard Buffett wants to pay more taxes. He does, and I, I, well, I am not going to go there. Why are you? You're, you're baiting me. <laughs> you're baiting me. I'm going to say that was a very interesting editorial he wrote. Now, thinking of communities or collaborators or partners, another word often comes up, friction. Are there points of friction? Um, where potential collaborators don't collaborate as well as they might, or the community is not as enthusiastic as it could be, or partners uh, have a falling out? Are there points of friction in plant science or trouble spots that we should be alert to? That's an interesting question. Science is, in many ways, a business, the scientific enterprise. We compete, just like businesses compete for customers and customer dollars. Scientists and organizations, universities that support research, compete for grant dollars, and we compete through submitting proposals. And in some cases, if you go to the National Science Foundation now, less than 10% of the proposals will be funded. So intense competition. That generates all of the characteristics of human behavior that you might expect. And might not want. And might not want. Once projects are funded and science is done and it comes time to uh, broadcast the results and take credit for the work that you're doing, 
sometimes there's a rush, a competition to get your results out first. So is there friction in science? Sure, but that's a, a consequence of the competitive nature of scientists generally. It's a reflection of the rewards that come to people who work efficiently and productively. I wouldn't say it's all in all bad. I think competition is very good. Occasionally you see some misbehavior, but science in general is a Compared to most other endeavors, science is, is pretty clean ethically uh, and as far as the bad behavior. You hear disproportionately occasional instances of, of scientific fraud, but they're in fact exceptionally rare. Well, I agree. Surprisingly I agree. rare. But that leads to another question. We've talked earlier about the staffing you've done and anticipate doing. Um, when you think about a research team being built, what do you hunt for in a scientist? Uh, a minute ago, I would have asked you, are you hunting for a good competitor? I, sh I should add one more point on the competition. We compete for talent. Yes. When we hire investigators here, we're competing for the best investigators with other institutions, universities, private institutes, companies that want to hire the types of people that we want to hire we have to be a attractive place to work. And there's lots of reasons, lots of, of things that make a place attractive to work. So competition for talent, that's, that's intensely keen. That, that creates friction sometimes. I'll give you an example. When I came here, or actually before I came here, I was at Oregon State University for 10 years. And when they found out I was leaving, they were, oh, yeah, we're kind of disappointed. All right, good luck. When we hired the best plant scientist from Oregon State University a few months later, Todd Mockler, again, in the front row here, that's when people said, ah, okay, we, we now we know what's going on here. Uh, that's when people got really irritated. So, yeah, there's friction going back to your previous question. And I actually, I forgot what the follow-on question was. Uh, there's friction. <laughs> no, the question was, what are you hunting for in a scientist? Yeah, very good question. What makes a good scientist? Uh, I can answer this in many different ways. Point out a few. This won't be a comprehensive list of what makes a good scientist. I'll start with this one. And sometimes people debate me on this. I'd be happy if anyone wanted to challenge me. The best scientists are the best guessers. Number one. They are the ones who can envision a scientific problem, figure out in their minds how a plant, if we're talking about plant science, how in their mind, uh, based on their knowledge of plants, might solve this problem, and then guess what the best experiments are to test their, their hypothesis. So a hypothesis is really a guess. The best scientists are the ones who have the best hypotheses, uh, but it does, that's only the beginning. That, that won't get you barely off the piece of paper you're sketching an idea out on. Then the best scientists are the ones who aren't afraid to do the experiments. Now that might sound funny. Why would you be afraid to do an experiment? Because most experiments fail. Experiments are risky from the standpoint of spending precious grant dollars from the standpoint of wasting people's time, or some people just don't like to do experiments that have a high probability of failing. And the big breakthrough experiments are the ones that no one has thought of, and therefore are the least likely, or the least obvious, rather, to be successful. So the great scientists are the ones who aren't afraid to fail. They, they're, they're really good guessers. They aren't afraid to fail by doing the big experiment as Phil Needleman calls it, the killer experiment. Uh, and then the best scientists are the ones who can recognize a result and quickly act on them. They can learn from their failures. Uh, oh, that's, you know, that, that's absolutely right. Just like in any endeavor, the best scientists are the ones who learn from their mistakes. And uh, most things that you do in the laboratory are mistakes, uh, things that 
uh, you set up that don't work and experiment. Uh, sometimes you misinterpret your experiments. Sometimes you have a brilliant result that you can't see because your mind is thinking in a different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you a quick example of this. I'll see if I can relate this brief story. I had a really talented postdoctoral scientist from Spain named Thassar Yave. I've had really good luck interacting with Spanish scientists who come to the lab. I have two Spanish scientists who are hiding back here, Alberto and Agata. Uh, but the first or the second Spanish scientist who came to the lab was Thessar Yave. Thessar did one of the most important things that anyone ever did in my lab. He discovered how these little snippets of genetic information called small RNAs were working in plants. And he set up an experiment and the result of the experiment showed that this molecule that we were visualizing through this particular test, his result was that the molecule was being split into two and the way that we were designing the experiment, we could see the two parts of the molecule separately. And we could also see if the molecule was still in one piece, we could see that one piece. And uh, Thessar, I saw him at the bench one day and he was, he was leaning over, puzzled, looking at the, the result and uh, he couldn't figure out what was going on. I said, Thessar, what, what are you looking for? And he said, well, I'm trying to find the one molecule. And there was no one molecule. Everything he was looking at were these two different molecules that were in separate pieces and they were right in front of his face. But he couldn't see the two molecules. He was looking for the one molecule and completely missed the fundamental discovery, which was the two different things. So. The, the, and, and, so, and Thessar learned all kinds of things from that experience, and I remind him of that experience every time. So the best scientists are the ones who can think outside of the box, so to speak, or to put it in cliche terms, uh, but practically, they're the ones who can extend their imagination and envision a scenario or a way that nature is working that nobody else has figured out. And Humans are not very good collectively at doing this. Yes, we have imaginations, but to figure out, use your imagination to figure out how something works, uh, there's not very many people who can do that well. I want to ask two more questions and then shift to the, uh, to the written questions. Uh, one has to do with the regulatory climate. Uh, I talked earlier about friction, but we are uh, plant science is affected to some extent by the FDA, affected to a large extent by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I suspect affected by the Environmental Protection Agency. And for all I know, the Department of Energy. Um, what is, how would you characterize the regulatory climate? Is it largely supportive or largely hindering yeah. or somewhere in the middle? Okay, by regulatory climate, I assume you're talking about if you want to commercialize a biotech product in agriculture. Is that what you're referring to? Okay, so a lot, most of, this of the corn, most of the soybeans that we grow in this country and in a number of other countries now is the product of biotechnology. We all know this. Monsanto has been the leader in commercializing uh, biotechnologically advanced seeds. But the United States and all other countries regulate these as special products. And in the U.S., we regulate them through a three-agency consortium of the USDA, the, Federal, the Food and Drug Administration, and the EPA. And they coordinate to take different parts of the regulatory job. Now, many of you know how drugs are regulated by the FDA and you have to go through lots of trials and you have to present lots of data. Uh, it's a different process when biotech plants are being commercialized, but roughly the same in terms of 
going through a rigorous process with lots of documentation. Okay, sounds great on the surface. Um, the problem is that we have so much experience now with biotech crops that we know what most of the risks are. We know what the hazards are. We know how to manage all of the hazards that we know about. Therefore, when we do the risk assessment, we have a pretty good handle on how to deal effectively with the hazards that actually exist. And it turns out after about 16 or so years of commercialization of these products, it's an incredibly safe technology. With the millions of acre years worth of crops that have been grown, there's not a single instance of any harm done to any animal or human. There, there's, no, there's no documentation. The European Union has spent half a billion dollars looking for it. So, but the problem is we have this really, uh, th we, we have these, these high barriers still. The, answer, the long answer is it's really expensive. Now, the outcome of that regulatory system, if we look at the commercialization landscape, is that those companies who can afford to pay the regulatory costs are able to commercialize these products. And they're able to manage them effectively. And they're able to profit from them. But if you're a small company. If you're a small company, you cannot in <coughs> any way get close to paying the regulatory, the cost of the regulatory burden. What that does is it excludes a large proportion of the entrepreneurial landscape. This shows up in the small and mid-sized companies that could not possibly compete with the larger companies that can pay the bill. So the larger companies don't have a direct interest in simplifying the regulatory environment because it would be to the advantage of their smaller competitors. Well, I don't, I, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, speak on behalf of the large companies out there. Um, but I will say, and, and, I, and I wouldn't say that the small companies are doomed. The small companies can still make a good living and ultimately, they can, in many cases, profit quite handsomely because the large companies have their eyes on all the, all the good small companies. Sure. Okay. So in many cases, the products of the small companies can make it into a commercial pipeline. It just has to involve a very strong partnership or a buyout. Like Pfizer does. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Monsanto does it too, as do sure. all of the large companies. Yeah. I was going to ask. I was going to ask whether St. Louis has a shot at becoming a Silicon Valley of plant science. But let me. That's sort of in the background of this question, and I'll start with the written questions. Of course, one of the mission components for the center to help drive life sciences as an economic engine of our region. Would you please describe your vision as to how this could happen in the coming years? For example. Will principal investigators generate technologies that will lead to the formation of companies, presumably small companies? Great question. That is one of the three pillars, one of the three posts on our mission, promoting economic development around plant science. The Danforth Center does this. We seek to fulfill our mission in a number of different ways. First of all, we aggregate people and information. We function in a community here in St. Louis that involves large companies like Monsanto, small companies like those in the Bridge Park building, universities scattered around the area, in the region in fact. Getting people together and interacting in, in, in groups like this, in scientific groups, in groups that are primarily business related through hosting international events like the Ag Innovation Showcase. Uh, bringing people together is one of our jobs. We also promote and encourage companies that spin out of the Danforth Center 
or that are co-founded by investigators and scientists at the Danforth Center. There are currently three companies over in the Bridge Park building that have as co-founders Danforth Center investigators. One just came from Oregon. That was co-founded by uh, Todd and I, as well as a computer scientist, uh, Doug Bryant, and an entrepreneur, Nathan Williams. We're all, all four of them are here. Um, and a very talented intern works with us, Kelly. Uh, that, that's my pitch for intuitive genomics, by the way. Um, but there's a number of other companies around biofuels, around commercializing plants uh, for uh, value-added chemicals. Then when we have a critical mass of companies, scientists, we have interactions in the region, this is an attraction for other companies to move to the area. Their, the latest company to move is a company called Semico. Governor Nixon was here a few weeks ago, made the announcement. They're in Bridge Park now. They have a number of incentives, uh, state and local incentives, to grow to 80 employees over the next five years or so. They're coming here not for random reasons, not just for those tax breaks that they're getting or the tax incentives. They're coming here because there's a critical mass that can help them. These are all of the direct and indirect ways that the Danforth Center, the scientists, the staff, and uh, in fact, you here can use the Danforth Center or the scientists and the science to promote economic development in the, in the region. Well, that may relate to this question. How can we, the citizens of St. Louis and fans of the center, help you achieve success? Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> because there are many ways that you can help. First of all, Robin Frankel uh, can give you information on how you can start contributing to the Friends. This is an organization that is amazing. I met with them for an hour and a half today, and it was a pep talk for this event. <laughs> I'm, so I'm more it excited. It worked. Look at the I'm crowd. Yeah, I'm more excited now about the Danforth Center than I was three hours ago because of the interaction with the Friends group. The Friends spread the word about the center. They help raise funds for the center. They put on events that draw people to the center and that are interesting. Hopefully there's something interesting tonight, but there's, if this one's not interesting for you, come to the next one because it, that one will probably be interesting for you. They do lots of things. So you can volunteer. You can contribute time and effort in other ways. We have an outreach and education program that reaches into schools, into community groups. We work with the St. Louis Science Center, all kinds of opportunities to volunteer. And by the way, those outreach events that we do are connected with our research. Many of the research organizations at the federal level won't give you a grant unless you promise to do an activity associated with that grant that takes the science out to the community. And we take that mission very seriously. You can volunteer there. Of course, you can contribute money. We are an organization that uh, does research, and research is very expensive, all things considered. Most of the money comes to pay for people that do the science. We have a very good, just to uh, pat the staff that raises money, that helps raise money, uh, and as well as all of the volunteers that help raise money, about 83% of the money that we raise goes to serve the science. If you look at our competitor or comparable institutions, the 17% to administer the science is actually quite an impressive number. So your money is put to work in, in the best way, I think. I get a sense that there are a lot of possibilities and you can choose from them or you can do all of the above. Absolutely. Are there any plant projects being conducted at the Danforth Center today that have tangible benefits that can be used within society within the next five years? Can you provide an example? 
yeah, let me give you three examples. First, when we talk about our mission to make better, more abundant food, we have a set of programs that seek to improve cassava. These are funded largely by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but also by some other groups, including the Monsanto Fund, the Howard Buffett Foundation, USAID. Cassava is a staple crop for nearly a billion people, but it's attacked by lots of viruses. It has very low nutritional value. It has some toxic chemicals that will make you sick if you don't eat cassava properly or prepare cassava properly. We have several programs seeking to improve the qualities of cassava in all of those areas. We have a timeline on these projects that at the current time, we're in field trials, and we're in field trials in places in the world that needs improved cassava. Three countries right now, Uganda, Kenya, and Nigeria. If we progress on the timeline that we have sketched out, we should have products available to farmers in the five to six year horizon. That's a realistic time frame to see the first products in the ground. We're, they're in the ground now, but they're in field trials. We're testing efficacy, we're testing safety, and we're testing other things, but we're in the efficacy and safety phase right now. In five years, you'll see uh, if things go according to the plan, products in the field. Uh, the second area is in the area of bioenergy. We have a number of programs to improve plants, to develop new types of plants, to revive some old crops like camelina that is related to uh, r related to certain oil crops that we currently use, uh, but has a number of advantages. For example, it can grow with less water. It is not unrealistic to see improved varieties of camelina in a five-year time frame. In fact, there's a proposal that was recently put in that's a three-year proposal that is entirely geared toward translating what we know and what we think we can do with camelina over a three-year period to get it primed in the commercial pipeline. It won't be commercialized in three years, but it'll be in the pipeline. The third area, and again, let me come back to this idea of using plants to make better medicines. We have all kinds of projects uh, from basic biochemistry projects to structural biology projects. These are, these are fascinating projects that involve high technology, bioinformatics, uh, knowledge of plants and natural variation that's out there. We're discovering new types of chemicals and how they're made. It's not unrealistic that we can use this information and within a five-year time frame have new types of plants that make slightly different types of chemicals in greater abundance. Now again, they may not be commercialized in five years, but we have the technology to have lots of different prospects fed into the research and development pipelines. So those are three examples of what we can do in something on a five-year horizon. I'm trying to envision the commercialization of the medicine that comes from a plant. Mm -hmm. um, would that be done by an entrepreneur who's working in our center here? Or would the technology be given, sold, transferred to an independent small company or to a Pfizer? How would we go from our research finding mm -hmm. to the pill that I can take? We're not going to make the pill you take. Someone else will make the pill you take. What we can do right now is we can provide industry with the raw materials that plants have evolved to make novel types of chemicals that have value in a number of therapeutic or medicinal for therapeutic or medicinal purposes. As Dr. Tony Kuchan is um, 
always around to tell you about 25% of our medicines come from plants. A amazing source, and we've probably only scratched the surface because the natural variation of chemicals in the plant kingdom, we, we know just a small sliver about the, the, the diversity of chemicals. But what we know how to do, what Tony's lab is really good at doing, and what Tom Smith's lab is really good at doing, is first discovering how plants make these chemicals and then modifying the plants to make different quantities of the chemicals or moving the ability of one plant, or moving the ability to make the chemicals from one plant to another. Perhaps the plants that make a really valuable chemical are not practical to grow on a large scale. Maybe the plants are endangered plants and you can't produce them on uh, in an agricultural setting. But if you can take the raw materials that make those chemicals, the genes that make the chemicals, and move them to plants that you can grow easily and economically, now you've got a way to produce a product that would be fed into a commercial pipeline that a, a pharmaceutical company would run. And if it's a particularly useful drug or candidate drug, there is funding out there to push that through the research and development pipeline. Is it realistic to think about once but, but we wouldn't do the human testing, for example. I understand, here. but is it possible to move now away from the plant to mimic or to synthesize the drug that was originally produced by the plant? That's right. And part of the advance that's been made in the pharmaceutical industry, which depends very heavily on creative chemistry mm -hmm. to manufacture drugs, specifically small molecule drugs. Wh what are they synthesizing? They're synthesizing what the plants make. Yes. So the contribution that the plant scientists have are first to discover the chemicals, second to figure out what the active chemicals are, third to figure out how they're made, and when it comes time for a chemical comp or a drug company to manufacture the chemical, they may use that knowledge to produce, th they may use that knowledge mm -hmm. as part of the process to manufacture a drug. Mm -hmm. They may extract the chemical directly from the plants and use them. They may extract the chemical that they then modify with just one or two steps afterwards, but taking advantage of what the plant has already provided. We expect that with your leadership and vision, the Danforth Center will achieve many basic hits and hopefully several home runs. You can tell this is a baseball town. <laughs> In the case of plant science, what home run possibilities do you see in the future here? What are the big, I, I've, I think I've touched on a few of these. <laughs> Let's go back to our mission. Our, the reason for being is to make better, more nutritious food. So uh, a home run in that arena is to have a product in the ground or have technology that we've developed here in products that <coughs> are making a difference where they're needed. Now that can be for entirely humanitarian purposes as we're doing with sweet potato in Africa, cassava in Africa, sorghum. We have programs in peanuts and a few other crops. Better, more nutritious foods for humanitarian purposes where there is not a commercial agricultural infrastructure that serves the crop or the people who consume the crop. That would be a home run. Maybe it's the crop that we would produce, push through a development pipeline, do all the testing, and deliver directly to farmers. Maybe it will be through that route, and we, we are doing that in some cases. Maybe it will be through a technology that we develop here and then donate for the humanitarian purposes that some other group or agency would develop in a crop. On the bioenergy side or on the environmental side, a technology or a crop that uses water more efficiently so we don't have to use precious fresh water irrigation resources or that use fertilizer more efficiently. We have a program here that's run by Ivan Baxter, who's one of our scientists that is here because of a partnership that we have with the USDA. Ivan's lab studies how nutrients are taken up 
and spread and how they accumulate in plants. These are called ions and his program, he's been involved in coining a term called ionomics. What this is is to understand how plants use these basic elements like potassium and phosphorus and iron. So if we can develop a technology that makes plants use minerals more effectively, water more effectively, um, or if we can develop a technology whereby algae can produce oils more cost effectively and at higher rates than we can currently produce them, and if we can contribute to, and, and, that and we can contribute at the level of producing strains that are more efficient, or technology whereby the oil gets pumped out of the cells effectively. Or if we can make a plant like camelina economically attractive for farmers to grow, and if the economics are right for camelina oil, that would be a home run. Yes. Every company that comes out and succeeds from the Danforth Center or that comes to the region because of the Danforth Center or what we participate in, every company that succeeds is a home run. I'm told by my controller that we have time for one more question. Is climate change being factored into where future crops will be able to be raised? That is, plants that live at lower elevations now, ne now need to be raised further north or at higher elevations. Uh, to what extent will climate change affect our ability to grow, what we grow, or do we simply make the plants more adaptable? We are on a course that we can track very well looking back with respect to climate change. We have amazing technology that can track changes from year to year, although those are really tough to make any sense out of. But from century to century, we can, we, we know what the temperature was 100 years ago. The fossil record provides an amazing scientific resource to understand what happened ages ago. So we have a pretty good sense looking backward what's happened in terms of how the climate is changing. We have really good measurements that show us what CO2 is doing. CO2 historically has fluctuated on very large time frames, but since uh, the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, we've seen a 50% increase in the atmospheric CO2 levels, and that's unprecedented. That's a, that, that's, you're looking at curves like this, that go like this, and then the past 120 years, it goes like that. They're striking curves. And this is physics when we talk about the impact of CO2 in the atmosphere, and we know what atmospheric CO2 does in terms of trapping heat and the consequences for a changing environment on a global scale. So the change that's happening is real. Now, if you forecast into the future, the problem with the future is it's so hard to predict. You don't have a fossil record. You don't have a fossil <laughs> record. And you've got to base your future predictions on your best assumptions that you have today. And those assumptions are going to be different in 10 years from now as we collect more information. But it's entirely reasonable to predict a set of scenarios where I'm sorry to tell you, if you don't already know, summers may be a little warmer in St. Louis in 100 years from now. Canada will be a much more attractive place to grow corn, as will Sweden, because the corn belt will migrate north. That's because areas that are too cool to support corn now will become warmer. Certain areas in this country and elsewhere will become more wet, they'll get more rainfall, and importantly, they'll have more episodic events. The intensity of the storms will increase. Some regions like the west will get even drier. Now, how can we mitigate these changes that we predict now? Uh, the best thing that we can do as scientists is apply science and make sure that we understand how plants cope with stress and start breeding plants now 
that use water more effectively because we're going to have to have plants that restrain withstand the extremes in the future much more than we need them now. The extremes are going to be uh, the extremes of poor soil, the extremes of pollutants. I hope my, there we go, came back on. Uh, extremes of pests. There are certain things that we know happen as CO2 increases in the environment. One of the things that happens is leaf chewing bugs become more hungry <laughs> as the CO2 levels increase. So the amount of pressure from pests is going to go up as atmospheric CO2 increases. We know that's going to happen and we can apply science now to make the next generation of crops 10, 20, 50 years from now better able to withstand those stresses. Good. I'm delighted but worried about climate change because I think it's huge. When I saw down here in the, in the rotating slides earlier, helping people grow their food forever, my first thought was climate change. Forever? That's a long time. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Jim Carrington, and I want to call on. <laughs> I want to call on our leader, Dr. Bill Danforth, for closing remarks. I'd just like to start by thanking Jim B. and Jim C for a great program. Thank you very much. <laughs> Second, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. You know, uh, we're so excited about having Jim C. here in St. Louis. And wouldn't it have been a shame if we don't even <laughs> have to fill the first two rows? <laughs> so thank you all for coming and helping to, uh, to welcome him. And. Um, Thanking you, uh, Jim B., for recognizing uh, Terry Carrington, who is with us. I've been worried about people meeting Ter Terry because I thought, so, you know, we've been saying how great Jim Carrington is. And then when you meet Car Terry, you might think we just hired him to get here in St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't, it isn't true. It isn't true. <laughs> we, we got excited about Jim before we knew Terry. <laughs> Terry is just a great additional plus. And finally, um, I have said in the past, you know, I feel Ted so lucky because we've been at the right place at the right time. We picked the right kind of problem when the science was right and the need was to solve a human problem was very great. And uh, now, uh, with, uh, with Jim here, I can add to that. We've got the right science and the right leader to make great contributions to the world and make our community better. So thanks for you all for being a part of this 